Uh-huh. Let me tell us about his, where the book is and wondering what, uh, maybe things will get better when the lockdown is lifted for us. Uh, but it's uh, worse in, uh, uh, it's not, it's been it's going to be lifted in the well. They don't know what they're doing. There's a wee bit of a, up in the air. But anyway, should we hear about his book and uh, appreciate that and um, uh, people have been asking about it, you know. All right. <laughs> so fine then. Uh, Right, let's uh, let's come then to uh, let's come then to pray again. Our gracious and our mighty God, we thank you for your blessings. We pray, Lord, your hand upon us. We pray, O oh Lord, you'll guide and help us now. We thank you for your goodness and your mercies to us, and we thank you for bringing each one in on this uh, amazing use of Zoom. And we pray, Lord, your leading. We pray, O oh Lord, your blessing, and we ask, O oh God, that you will take uh, Donald up and use him for your honour and praise and glory. We thank you, Lord, for the great testimony that uh, William Kidd brought this morning on um, uh, Heartland Radio 3, uh, Midlands Radio 3, and we pray, Lord, that many people may be up and listening to that. We ask, O oh Lord, your blessing, we pray in Jesus' name, and for his sake and glory. Amen. We'll hand over uh, the meeting to, to Donald. Uh, he has the rest of it then. All right. Thank you. Well, for good, good evening, everyone. It's, it's uh, great to be with you again. And uh, I must say you're all looking well. And uh, the Lord bless you. Um, what I'm going to do is read a few verses from the book of Isaiah. If you are following it in the Bible, I'm going to read a few wee verses in Isaiah and then we'll uh, introduce our subject. The first verse I'm going to read is in Isaiah 12. And the second verse, actually, is Isaiah 12 was one of my father's favorite chapters in the Bible. Someone gave it to him when he was a young man and it was read at his funeral. But verse 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And, and then if you go over into uh, chapter 41, you'll get uh, the theme that I'm going to talk about this evening. And, and Isaiah 41, and I think I'll read verses 10 to 14. And uh, Isaiah 41, verse 10, reads again, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contended with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as an unexistent thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold you, uh, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I will help you, says the Lord, and your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now, the last few verses I'll read at this stage, then is just over the page or two again, is uh, Isaiah chapter 43. And again, you may be getting the, uh, the trend already, uh, what I'm going to speak about. But Isaiah 43, verse 1 says, But now thus saith the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called by your name, your mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be born, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Sabia, uh, Sabia for your place, in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, you have been honoured, and I have loved you. Therefore I will give men for you, and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Now, I think we'll end a reading there at the moment. 
And really the subject I want to talk about uh, the, this, this, this tonight is about the subject of fear. Fear. And I read in your hearing tonight and all of those, you know, trust in the Lord and be not afraid. And again, Isaiah 41, to fear not several times, it said fear not. And, uh, you know, in recent times up here, the, the levels of anxiety, the, the levels of worry, the levels of concern have re been greatly raised. Uh, and in fact, you know, many Christians are in a state of worry, a state of fear. And the Lord, you know, just put these two wee words in my heart. It's, it's all according to what verse in the scripture, but they're near enough the same. Fear not or, or don't be afraid. And it made me to consider just a little bit about fear. And I want to share something about that tonight. Now, I had heard on different occasions that in the Bible, there are 365 fear nuts. Now, on further study of that, I think actually, uh, and of course, it's all according to what version you read, the actual words fear not, in that sense, fear not, is maybe just over 100 times. However, the whole issue of fear is recorded in the scripture over 500 times. And when you take all the verses, not to be anxious, and all the scriptures the Lord Jesus told us about worry, you, you could say without any problem that in the scripture, there are, uh, you could get a promise for every day of the year to not to be afraid or to fear not or not to be anxious or not to worry. However, it is an amazing and a large subject. And indeed, because of this whole pandemic, uh, I know people and they've been in isolation all the time. They've they have a great fear of, of getting COVID-19. And then there are younger people who are in jobs and their fear of the loss of job and redundancy and all of that would, uh, you know, mortgages to be paid, children to be fed, and it brings in fear. And uh, really, you know, as I came, the Lord really put in my heart these two e words, fear not or do not be afraid. Now, the first thing I want to say in the whole subject of fear or fear not, it actually isn't wrong to be afraid. The Bible doesn't say that, you know, you shouldn't fear. And actually, when, when, I, when I look through the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, it's all scattered throughout the word of God to fear not. It is put there, recognizing that we do have fears. Recognizing that people have worries. Recognizing people have concerns. And the Lord comes along in those circumstances and in those situations. He gives us wonderful promises to fear not. Now, I might add that fear not is for the believer. It's for the child of God. In fact, if you were not a believer, and no matter what your topic might be or what your views are on eternal punishment is, and there's no doubt there's eternal punishment, and listening just briefly to the bit of banter at the start about William. William, being his testimony this morning, the concern that the Lord brought before him that there's an eternity. And that eternity is heaven, or whether you describe the broad subject of hell or eternal punishment or whatever, there is an eternal punishment for those that know not Christ. And so, therefore, those that are outside of Christ have reason for fear and also uh, I, I, I would point out on studying this subject there are two types of fear it's much broader than that but you could describe it two major categories of fear there's a good form of fear in fact uh, the word of God says that, that, that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and that's a good fear and, and, and the, word, the word of God tells us about, you know, uh, about the fear of man brings a snare and all that sort of thing. But as you read through the word of God, the fear of God and understand that God is, it's a, it's a gnaw, it's a reverence, it's a godly fear, I would describe it as. Recognizing there is a, a creator God. Recognizing that there's someone who's the supreme, who's providential, who is sovereign in all his ways. Someone that we will have one day to give an account to. And to recognize that outside of the Lord Jesus, that 
There is such a thing, not only as a love of God, but there is a justice of God. There's a wrath of God. And therefore, we need a reverential fear of God, recognizing that he is a sovereign Lord of the universe. And that is a fear that is a good fear. It's a good fear. In fact, I would argue that, you know, a godly fear is a wonderful thing. And, and it's probably one of the things that William recognized when he gave his testimony, a godly fear that there was a God of creation, there was a God of a heaven, and there was a God who we sinned against, and there was consequences of that, and he had a reverential fear of God, and that fear of God and the consequences of dying without Christ led him to the Savior. What a wonderful thing in that terms of, of a godly fear. And you know, one has said, if you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. If you fear God. And that's not a fear that you're necessarily shaking with your knees, although before conversion it could well be that, under the conviction of sin, the fear of God could be a, a, a very big thing. So I, I, I would say at start, for those, in case anybody in my hearing, or, or in case somewhere down the line someone might hear this, to recognize there is two fears. There's a fear of God. There is a fear that we need to think about. A fear. You know, the Lord Jesus said, he said to fear not him that can kill the body, but to fear him that could will kill the body and the soul and, 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 and put them into a lost eternity as it were. There is only one person that a Christian should fear, and that is God. When you're fearful of man, that will lead to a fear of evangelizing others and doing God's will, trusting God less. It will cause rebellion, being ashamed, compromising, and actually being a friend of the world. Fear the one who created man, the one who can throw you into a, a hell for eternity or a, an eternal punishment for eternity. That's the one we need to fear. And yet tonight, as believers, we don't need to fear that. We can, the Lord can come to say to fear not. We've been redeemed by precious blood. We are safe and secure in Christ and we're sure of heaven. That's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to not have that fear, to have, to, to, to have a fear of God that led us to repentance and, and, and brought us to Christ. And tonight, as far as our soul's eternal salvation is concerned, we have no fears. It's a wonderful thing. And then again, when I was looking at this subject, you know, uh, again, where, where fear probably was introduced was after the fall. Adam, uh, I, I, again, a lot of views on it, but we know Genesis 3 is the fall of man has been. And before that, Adam and Eve had perfect communion with God. Uh, it, it records of man walking and Adam and Eve walking with God in the cool of the day. Uh, and they had total you know, communion with one another. And yet then, you know, the tree of evil, of the good of evil, and, and we know how Adam partook, and we know how sin entered in the world. And then what does it tell us? Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Now that's the first question God asked in the Bible, where are you? There's a gospel implication to that in terms of a person's eternal soul salvation, to ask the question, where are you as far as you're concerned, as far as God's concerned, where are you, where do you stand in the light of God? And this is what Adam said. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. The fall of man and sin brought fear into the world. And, you know, fear has not something that happened at the start of coronavirus. Fear has been down through the generations. And the wonderful thing about it as believers, the wonderful thing for you and I tonight as we love and serve Jesus is that he comes alongside us and he says, fear not. He says, fear not. Don't be afraid. And I'm talking to a varied, uh, various, various people here tonight, scattered actually throughout Ireland, Northern Ireland, did we say Scotland and, and England? I think we're missing the Welsh, somebody said. Doesn't matter, we're scattered. And, and, and there are people that will have different various concerns for whatever reason, and perhaps worries. But you know, at the start of this pandemic, 
the Lord really put in my heart, you know, I'm sovereign, I'm over all, the God's not took by surprise, and, you know, just looked ahead. God will take care of you. And he would come to unite and aid as believers, as blood-bought believers, and say, fear not. Now, when, when God says fear not, that doesn't mean to be stupid and go out and uh, go against all government regulations and stand your head in the middle of the street. That's not, that's not what's been suggested here. But to live in the environment that we're in without this fear over our head and, and, and uh, the, the, the lovely verses of Scripture. And, and actually, the, the first time, and again, that really is recorded, you see, um, of fear not in the Scripture. Is, is when I said to Abraham, or Abram as he was described before he became Abraham, Genesis 15, after these things, now I'm not going to, after these things, I can tell you, Abraham was just coming out of a war. He was just coming out of a battle with kings. He, he was just coming out of a situation where he had met Melchizedek, and there's a long, long story on that. We're not going to, but after these things, after a lot of difficulties and problems, and after wars, what happens after these things? The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. And you know tonight, I really feel that's very personal. Go to other ones. I'll maybe end up on one. We'll watch your time uh, here. God came along to Paul and said, fear not Paul. I'll bring you to that scenario later. Paul, the mighty Paul, the mighty evangelist, the mighty writer of many of the epistles, the man who in many ways were fearless, but God came to him and said, fear not Paul. He must have had a reason for saying, fear not Paul. And tonight, perhaps on this screen, as I look at you, you could be coming and saying, you know, fear not John, fear not John, fear not David, fear not Sam, fear not Sharon, fear not Jimmy and Janice, <laughs> all these names up here. God's very personal. To fear not. And all of your concerns. And in that verse of scripture. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying fear not Abram. And that's to think about. You know the peace that comes from knowing God. The peace that comes from knowing God. Fear not. Fear not Abram. It was a personal relationship. You know Abram actually was called a friend of God. That's a, a wonderful thing. And yet, the Lord Jesus, when you come into the New Testament, says of believers or those that love him, he said, you are my friends. Friendship with Jesus. Fellowship divine. Oh, what blessed, sweet communion. Jesus is a friend of mine. And as a friend of Jesus, we can, he would come tonight, I believe, and he'd say, in that, by, by the fact that we know him through conversion, he would say, fear not, the peace that comes from knowing God. And then he, he says, fear not, Abram, I am thy shield. I'm your shield. And we have protection from knowing God. As we're saying, he's coming out of a war. And of course, we have the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6. And he could say to Abram, fear not, Abram, <laughs> I'm your shield. And then, not only that, there was reward and the exceeding great reward. Fear not. And then, actually, again, the last, and a sprinkle there on through the Bible, he says, fear not, or, or do not be afraid, whatever your version reading to Abram. And then he says to John, way over there in the Revelation, hoping you can get it here. But it was wonderful. Mind you, John was the beloved disciple. He basically outlived them all. I think he was the only one. Well, Judas, as you know, hung himself. I think all the other men, by and large, were martyred. But John was a knight of Patmos. He wasn't having a great time, to be frank. And he 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 had a he had a he, he, he met up again with the risen Christ. He had a vision of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And in Revelation, when he saw the risen Christ, who he knew so well in the earth and lay on his breast and walked with him for over three and a half years. And actually, John was known as the beloved disciple by the Lord Jesus. 
And in this revelation, when, 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 when the Lord was revealed to John in Revelation 1, 17, and when I saw him, when he saw the Lord in all of his glory, he said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But you know what happened? It says, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Why? For I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Haiti and of death. It's a wonderful thing. Even Abram away there in, in, in Genesis. How the Lord came and said, Fear not, Abram. And the beloved disciple in Revelation, he, he could come to him and, and, and as he saw the risen, exalted Christ, he, he could, he just touched him. Perhaps there's someone wants just a wee touch tonight that the Lord to reach out and perhaps you're lonely. Perhaps you're fearful. And can I tell you that God loves you tonight? And can I tell you he would reach out his lovely hands and touch you and say to you, brothers and sisters tonight in Christ, fear not. Fear not. He's in control. He says, I'm the first and the last. He's the eternal God. And he said, this is wonderful. I am he that liveth and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Can I tell you as a child of God tonight, as a blood-bought believer, you know, if we're to leave this world, well, it's only gets better. He's the resurrection and the life. And thank God that what makes the gospel different from all the others. And what is it? Not only that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, but he rose again. And he's alive forevermore. And the wee hymn writer said, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he lives. We are in his hands tonight. He loves you. He cares for you. And dear child of God, you know what he would say tonight? Fear not. And I'll tell you, he has the keys of the afterlife. And my, the key for us is into heaven and glory for the countless years of eternity. What a wonderful thing to be saved. What a wonderful thing to be child of God. And that's why those that know not Christ need to fear him because he has the keys of Hades. He has the keys of the afterlife. And for those that know not of Christ, we're going to let Christless eternity, where the worm dieth not, and where the fire is not quenched. That's what God's word says. But oh tonight. Oh tonight. To know that it's well with our souls. And in a situation even a coronavirus. I believe the lovely Lord Jesus like John of old would. Just touch us with his hands. And say fear not. It's extremely. It's extremely personal. It's a wonderful thing to know the touch of God. We can rely on him. He, he, he's someone who, who, who loves us and, and, and someone who cares for us. I, I read in your hearing again, you see, Isaiah 43. Special scripture to me. And this is what it says, and, and, and I know the context is the nation of Israel. I know that. However, Isaiah 43 says, But now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and who formed you, O Israel. I want to say this much. God created Jacob. Jacob, as you know, was a twisted wee man. You wouldn't have trusted him too much. But God took a Jacob and he made him into an Israel. He's working on all of us. And anybody that's born again of the Spirit of God, like Jacob, he created them, were new creatures in Christ Jesus. And through our life, he sanctifies us, he changes us, and I can say he's still working on me, and he creates us. And Israel is a prince with God. He took a twisted little Jacob and he made him into a mental prince of God. But the point is, he says to him, and he says to Israel, fear not, 
fear not. Why? For I have redeemed you. Redeemed. Now, the wonderful thing in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus has redeemed us. I am redeemed, oh, praise the Lord. My soul from bondage free is a wonderful thing to be redeemed. The redemption to be bought back out of the prison house. To be bought out of slavery. To be bought back out of the pawn market. God created us. And we fell in sin. And we belong to God by creation, but we fail. But he not only done that, he redeemed us. He bought us back. And tonight, if you're a child of God, the word of God would say, fear not, for I have redeemed you. We've been redeemed by precious blood. Redeemed by the blood of Christ. And we're safe and we're secure for both time and eternity. For heaven and home is a wonderful thing to be redeemed. My father and mother now lies up in Coldbrook Graveyard and the headstone has just one word at the bottom of it. Redeemed. Redeemed. It's a wonderful thing to be redeemed. But here's the thing why I, 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 I like this verse and it's a wonderful promise. To fear not for I have redeemed you. He says, he says when you pass through the waters, not if, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. He says, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, maybe thinking of the three Hebrew children here, you shall not be burned, nor shall the for, neither shall the flame scorch you. Um, I have the date. I can't give you the exact date, but I, I do know, uh, I can give you it because I have it somewhere. My mother went to be with Jesus in June of last year. But the previous year, she was diagnosed. She wasn't well at all. And I had to bring her down to the cancer unit in Alton Galvin Hospital. And that morning, I had to drive down to Bally Robert, knowing, and my mother knew that probably what the consultant was going to tell her wasn't going to be great. And she says, Donald, you'll not believe what, what, what is my Bible reading for today? Well, it was Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43. And this is what it said. But now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. And she had been redeemed as a young girl of 14 in a wee, a wee hut outside Brickburn. Heard the gospel, concerned by her soul, and was gloriously and wonderfully, and I believe, eternally saved. And that's the only test she's redeemed. And then she lived all her life, a simple wee life, and she lived, you know, up along Lane and Fermanagh for 62 years with my father. Well, you know, my father, for my father preceded her. But that was the promise you got in that day. But here's the thing. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fires, you shall not be born. Nor shall the flame scorch you. Nor it didn't. And then this was the comment on that daily bread reading that you had for that day, which was the 14th, uh, the 14th uh, of August. It was a Tuesday in 2018. It talked about when you pass through the rivers, they shall not sweep over you. The raft, the rafting guide escorted a group, group to the river's edge, talking about um, riding the rapids, and directed us to put us put on the life jackets and grab pub, pub, uh, paddles. As we walked into the boat, he assigned us seats to balance the boat's way, weight, providing stability when we encountered rap rapids. After highlighting the thrills the watery voyage ahead would hold for us, he detailed a sense of directions we should expect to hear and would need to follow to effectively steer the boat through the white water. He assured us that, he assured us that even through there might be tense moments on the way, our journey would be both exciting and safe. Sometimes life feels like a, a, a white water ra ra rafting trip, one that contains more than rapids than we might like. God God's promise to Israel through the prophet Isaiah can guide, guide our feelings when we fear the worst is happening. When you pass through the rivers, they shall not sweep over you, Isaiah 43 and 2. The Israelites faced an overwhelming fear of rejection by God as they went into the exile 
as a, con a consequence of their sin. Yet instead, he affirms them and promises to be with them because he loves them. God won't abandon us in the rough waters. We can trust him to guide us through the rapids, our deepest fears and most painful troubles, because he also loves us and promises to be with us. And then there was a prayer. Thank you, Lord, for being my guide through troubled waters. Help me to trust you even when the journey is wild and scary. And you know, for the next 10 months, the consultant told mother she had cancer, told her that he couldn't cure her. And for the next 10 months, she went through those waters and through that fire. And you know something I can honestly say, she never feared. Didn't mean she hadn't bad days. Didn't mean she hadn't gone morphing at the end. But you know, I never seen her faith wobble once. And she went through the rough waters. And I do know this, every day the Lord Jesus was with her. And that promise was 100% true. And she was a lady of 86, coming 87 years of age. And she went out then to be with Jesus. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. It's a wonderful thing to be redeemed. And to know even in the most difficult circumstances of life, that there's one said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, the psalmist David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Fear not. And then in Isaiah 41, there's these lovely promises again. And I often read them to people who are in trouble and people who, you know, are discouraged and, and people maybe have an health issue or someone who is, uh, you know, in, 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 in a bereavement situation or someone perhaps who's facing Redundancy, whatever the case may be, and, and they're so well known. But uh, verse 10 of, of chapter 41 of Isaiah says, Fear not. Why? For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Uh, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Fear not. And you know, uh, these are not my thoughts, but I have them uh, for a long time. They said there's seven wee assurances there. I fear not. Seven assurances, one for every day of the week. The word of, a word of comfort. Fear thou not. Fear, it says, it's personal. Don't you fear. It says here, fear not. That's personal. And that's a word of comfort. And if there's anybody as a fear tonight, whatever it is, take it as a word of comfort. And then he says, for I am with you. Isn't that wonderful? For I am with you. And that's a, a word of companionship. You know, there are a lot of people on their own through this. And, and like, we can't make light out of that. People are lonely. That There's people that only can talk to them in through the window. There, there's people that doesn't see anybody from one end of the week or the other. So I'm not making light out of this, but they have a, a, a very, for those that are born again, they have the Lord with them. And can I say as Christians, do lift the phone and ring those people. And, and I thank God for the, the ordinary Christian people who are, are not preaching like me, but they're very practical and seeing to these people and maybe leaving around a wee dinner an odd day for them and, 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 and all of that. This is the hands and feet of Jesus. But, you know, in the big picture, the Lord Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There's come, fear not, for I am with you. A word of companionship. Uh, and then it tells us here, be not dismayed. All this lockdown and all these regulations, perhaps you, you, you could be dismayed. But as a child of God, can I tell you, God is still on the throne. And he will remember his own his promises through. He will not forget you. God is still in the throne. Be not as that's a word of fear. That's a word of, of, of confidence. Confident. And then it says here, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Why? For I am your God. Jehovah God. I am your God. That's a confirmation, someone, if you're born again of the Spirit of God, He's on our side. 
As many as receive him to them, he, he gives the power or the authority to become the sons of God. And that's an amazing thing. We can come to him tonight of a truth and say, our Father who art in heaven, and he loves you and he cares for us. And it's a word, I am your God. And if he's not your God tonight, he can be. He can be. In the person of Christ, have become been repentance of faith. And then he, he doesn't only say that. He says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. That's a word of courage. My, my, when you hear all the news and you hear the, you know, some areas, there's a, there's one church up our way and there's 50 families had to isolate. And, uh, and I was in that town yesterday, no, yeah, yes, yesterday, and they said you're, they're afraid to walk up the street. And those Christians were talking to. I did walk up the street, not at my mask and all. Well, actually, I didn't. It was in the south, near, the, near, near the main street. I was delivering some of the books that John talked about. But a word of courage. I will strengthen you. And then, it says here, not only that there, it says, yes, I will help you. I will help you. And that's a word of compassion. Oh, we have a God who helps us. Perhaps you feel things are not going too well tonight. Well, God will help you. The Lord is my helper. The sun shall not smite by day nor the moon by night. If you have your faith and trust in God, it's a wonderful thing. I'll help you. And then he says, uh, you know, if you wanted that, then I will, I will, it's not I might, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And that's a word of consolation. And so these promises of God where he says to fear not, the fear not. Now, there are many fears not, and if you want to do a study on fear not, you know, in, in, in the book of Luke, there's about seven fear nots there, and, and you know, some of these fear nots coming up to Christmas, where, where the Lord Jesus, and it was a difficult, he told Mary when he came to say that she was going to be the vehicle where the Lord Jesus was going to come through the earth, he came to Mary and he said, fear not, Mary. Uh, and then think of the, the news that, that Joseph was going to get. And they came to Joseph and he said, fear not, Joseph. And the incarnation came through in the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus through Mary. But I mean, these were big scenarios when you read them. But the Lord came and said, fear not. And actually when the wise men then out, when they came and said, a saviour is born, uh, they came and they said, fear not. Oh, they were scared. And they went in and seen the lovely saviour, the saviour of the world. But you know, there's one that uh, caught my attention again uh, in, in Acts. And uh, toward the end of Acts, uh, and, and you know how, how, how Paul was in prison for about two years. He was in lockdown. He was definitely in lockdown. He was in lockdown for two years. And uh, you know the situation. And then he was to go to Caesar. And then they got him on a boat. And there was an amazing storm blew up on the boat storm and you know many can see this as a, a storm in life and uh, it, it, I just want to read it in the context here of, of Acts 27 and he's on he's on the boat now the, Philip told the guys in the boat he says don't go the route you're going but they wouldn't listen to him or Paul told them but then it came to they did listen to them but he told them that he could say to the people on the boat, he says, And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood, be, stood by me this night an angel of God, to whom I belong and to whom I serve. What did that angel of God tell him? Saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. Why? You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who shall who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. And here was Paul, and you know the whole story, how he went up to Jerusalem and how he was had it was in prison for two years, held at Caesarea. 
and the whole riot that was in Jerusalem. And from Acts 21, uh, right up to Acts 27, we read from, was a period of over two years. And Paul was a prisoner, first by the Jewish authorities, then by the Roman government. And then he was to appear to, to, to Caesar. And in chapter 27, Paul is known as Wade Etle. And for his case to be heard before Caesar, Paul was in custody of a centurion named Julius, if you want to read the background, uh, and Luke. And Aristocarchus was with him, and you read that uh, in, in, in chapter 27, verses 1 and 2. And along the way, they encountered some stormy weather. Paul was on a journey from Caesarea to Rome. And someone said, you know, we're all on a journey in the sea of life. We're all on a journey in the sea of life. And you'll find on that journey of life, even as Christians, there'll be storms. The world's going through a storm at the minute. Ireland's going through a storm at the minute. Perhaps you're going through a storm in your individual life, but there's storms. And you know, the older you get, you'll definitely know that there are storms of life. And they can come up very quick. They can blow up very quick. And every one of us is on a journey between two eternities. We're on the sea of life. And you know, I often read Psalm 107. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a psalm about storms. And there's going to be storms. And the wee hymn writer said, When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, do not be discouraged. You know why? Because God is over all. And in that storm, in that storm, when, when Paul was heading to Italy, and the storm blew up, the Lord came and gave him a promise. He said, listen, I told you you're going to go to Caesar and go before Caesar. It's going to happen. And so he had the presence of God in the storm. Presence of God in the storm. God guarded Paul through the storm. He didn't take him out of the storm. God guarded him through the storm. And again, as I say, thinking of all the scenarios that people are facing today, and even as believers, we're, we're in the same coronavirus pandemic with all the issues that are around it. Christians have died of coronavirus, I might add. An elder in our church went to be with the Lord, and, and he had coronavirus. And, 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 and just in that church in Balamone, uh, Dr. Karen's a man of 80, and I understand he died of coronavirus. The difference is that God was with them. The difference is they're in heaven today. And we will meet again. And it's a glorious place, heaven. And that was the one thing of Paul. He always this conference. He says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He told the Philippian readers, uh, church, he says, listen, I'd rather depart to be with Christ, he says, which is far better. Far better. And you know, it didn't really worry, but God guarded him through the storm. And he came alongside him. And I, I was looking at that again, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. Paul must have been a bit afraid, or he wouldn't say, do not be afraid, Paul. So he wasn't judging Paul, or I'm not judging anybody because there's a fear. But God would come and say, fear not. Why? Because I'm with you. Because I'm going to be present with you in the storm. And then he made a proclamation in the storm. You know, he says, you're going to see Caesar. I told you you're going to, see, and it's going to happen. In God's presence, in God's promises through the storm. And you can have that tonight. I can have that tonight. In God's plan in the storm, believe it or not. God's plan in the storm. God's a plan for all of our lives, even in the storms of life. And he was going to bring, actually he was going to stop in Malta, wasn't he? And he was going to see people saved. And he got an opportunity to, to reach out to the people on the boat. And there's a whole story about that, about staying on the boat. And God's power, what happened? If you read the whole story in Acts 27, what does it say in the last verse? On the rest, speaking about the, the, the people on the boat, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. So it was that they all escaped safely to land. And I'll tell you tonight, if you're on the old gospel ship, one day we'll land safe and heaven's shore. 
metaphorically speaking. We're safe and secure in Christ. If we're on the ship, if we're in Christ, my, it's wonderful. Safe and secure in Christ. And he land us safe. And I actually, and I have it down here, uh, and the other Bible here, because he followed that story through. Paul was in lockdown, we'll call it, because we all know about lockdown and social isolation and all that crack now, don't we? He was two years in prison. If people are, he ended up there and he got to Rome. What happened to him there? He spent two years in a, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all and received all that came in on him. But he was in a house and he was tied to a Roman soldier. Uh, and all, but he wrote he wrote a lot of epistles there. And God can use you in lockdown. And think about that. How can God use me in lockdown? Just glad to hear, William, before you come on. So John was singing your praises, so don't get big-headed. About the testimony you gave on radio this morning. God can use you, use you in lockdown. We're all getting used to this Zoom. And it just may be your neighbours down along the street that you just need to show a bit more love and care to and say, how are you? See, have they any fears? Pray with them. Don't judge them. How can we in lockdown? Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't locked down, but God, I have a track here saying God's not in lockdown. And Paul was in lockdown for another two years, and it was uh, Sam, uh, Sandy Rogers, I heard him speaking in Lisbon a number of years ago for the faith mission. And he, he, he spoke in these verses way, way far further than I could. But he talked about being in confinement. And a lot of us, he was talking more about people with disabilities. And funny enough, that night, the Disabled Christian Fellowship were given a report. And he said how God can use you in confinement. We're nearly all in confinement at the minute. And he said it didn't stop Paul. Because Paul still prayed in, Paul still prayed in confinement. Now, we up here at 2D Hours uh, laid aside today, some people, just to pray for against COVID-19, and we've been praying two hours today. But there, there are a lot of initiatives going on in prayer. Get involved in prayer. God hears prayers from your bedroom, from anywhere. God, Paul didn't stop. He wasn't confined. He was praying through. Used to. And then, and, 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 and Sandy Roger talked about, you know, John Bunyan. Old John Bunyan, you see. I wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the most read book outside the Bible. And John Bunyan, by the way, was a tinker. John Bunyan wasn't a professor. The Lord gloriously and wonderfully and eternally saved John Bunyan. And he was 12 years in Bedford Prison. You see, God can use anyone. And actually, John Bunyan read, wrote something like 50 books. He wasn't an educated man. God educated him. And he became, they called him Bishop Bunyan at the end. I, I, I mean, as a pat word, he was a Baptist, and there's no bishops in the Baptist with elders and that. But it doesn't matter whether about that. But, but they, that was a pat name for him because they loved him so much. You see, John Bunyan wasn't confined in prison. I, I think down there, my good friend down there in Tipperary, Dick Q with arthritis, top to bottom nearly, and God give him the pen, let him use the pen. And, and, and in particular, as we book, No Longer Hoping has been used, you see, actually, I'd say millions, but certainly hundreds of thousands of it has been. I sent out 800,000, no, 600,000 of it here in Northern Ireland alone into homes. He's wrote another we is a desire just to let you know how God can use you in lockdown. Don't get displacing. Say, God, how can you use me in lockdown? He's written a wee book, New Life and Luke. This is a boy in Tipperary. Worked in a soup factory, by the way. Not a professor. And he has a, a heart for India. I, I'm on the We Trust, you see, the Charith Gospel Trust, but he's a heart for a heart for India. And he's got that book into Hindi. And now it's in Telugu and Tamil. And they want another 150,000 copies. 
to go to India. And it's the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, and then some of Dick's wee thoughts. God can use you in lockdown, my friend. And he used Paul in prayers and he used Paul's pen, but Paul was a highly academic man. And my dad, a wonderful brain, a wonderful man. And people, the people came to Paul into the house. See, my mother in that last 10 months, and all them wee nurses coming in, and she loved them, and they loved her. And she had a wee Bible beside the bed, of course, and then she had wee daily readings that Joan, the late Joan Masters brought to her, and she had all the promise of God, and they found her, they just loved coming to her. And as people come into your house, you can be a witness, you see. Didn't, confinement didn't. Minute. And, 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 and that hit me, you see, just how personal it was. And even the mighty Paul, even the mighty Paul, that an angel of God, he said, who am I? I belong to him and I serve him. And you know, we're sons and sisters, or sons and daughters of God tonight. By, by new birth. But also, I hope we're serving him. Paul, Paul, Paul knew his identity in Christ that, that he was a son of God. But he also served God. Just a servant. And Paul is one in confinement too. And, and the mighty Paul, this angel of God came, said, do not be afraid, Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. Don't be afraid. I, I just want to end, and I see the time's nearly gone, with two wee stories. It must have been last week. Or maybe the week before, my phone rang. Some of you maybe know Mary and Alan McBride, great gospel literature too. And and I and I I would speak in the wee mission hall. And Mary rings me, she says, There's a man here at her house, he wants to talk to you. I says, Does he? Put him on. So the boy comes on and says, How are you, Donald? I hadn't a clue who he was. And I says, Friend, I'm very, very sorry. I've not been big headed, but I haven't a clue who you are. And it, it turned out. It turned out that it was a fella who went to the same church as I did. I'm 63, he's 60. That's about 40 years ago. But this is what he said, and, and, and I, I had it written down somewhere, and I hope, yes, I have. He said, you know, at the end of it, when he told me who he was, and he'd went away uh, to Newton Arge, and he'd been living there for 40 years, married with four children, a labouring man. But he says, you know, one of the things that blessed me all my life my father was an elder in the, in the particular assembly down in Brookborough at that time. He says, your father, this is now 40 years ago. He says, your father used to quote regularly in his prayers, Psalm 37, 25. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or the children begging bread. He says, you know, through my lifetime, I had many a tight corner, sometimes wondering but he says I have proved that promise all my life have the four children reared and why he was up at that people's house he was cutting sticks for them and he's not a millionaire yet and doing the rest but he says the Lord has looked after me all the life and he says I have verse you see I've held on to that verse I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor their, nor his children beg in bed. And I can tell you tonight, that is true. Fear not. Redundancy could be facing you in the eyes. Where's the next pound going to come from? You know, if you're a child of God, stand on the promise of God. People have proved them through the years. Now, John mentioned the wee book, uh, Still Walking. I wrote that still walking for, I've been walking with God 42 years. Mind you, I'm only just a middle and creator, but I thank God that I've been, he saved me 42 years ago. And we're walking with God and he's walking with me. But uh, I, I, I try to write this wee daily devotion, one for the every day of the week. And there's a wee woman I go to for a charity shop we have. And mind you, mind you, she lives in a wee small holding and she's 82 and she's lived there all her life. And she collects stuff up, <clears throat> some of it middle enough of my dad, but we'll go to get this stuff because that's the wee job she's doing for the Lord. And then she told me one day, I was, I was there on Thursday lifting stuff. And she says to me, Donald, I'll tell you story, take a wee hand for that board seat and put it out in that wee poppy outside for the wee rod. 
She's the most contented woman ever I met. And I, I, I put a wee... I put a wee story about her in this book on this here because just I want to let you know to fear not that God will take care of you. And I have on the 12th of November, anyway, look, uh, the verse of scripture, Matthew 6, 26, look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Well, I love birds and nature too. The Bible speaks about birds on many occasions. It mentions over 50 species of birds. Matthew 6, 26 teaches us to look at the birds of the air in times of anxiety or worry. They are an example of God's loving care. Now, worry has been heightened during the time of the coronavirus pandemic. However, worry is nothing new. <clears throat> it has been around for thousands of years, and we've talked about that tonight. Jesus offers to us a solution for worry in his Sermon on the Mount. As Jesus is sitting on the mountainside with the crowds all around, he observes their faces drawn from the trials of life. One can imagine that he looks up and sees the birds flying overhead. He then points out to the crowd, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? And you are. Jesus is not making little of our worries. Rather, Jesus is teaching the crowds to remember who is in control and how much he cares for them. This message is true today. God knows what we need. Jesus wants us to stop worrying and gives us two pieces of practical advice. Firstly, to trust in God who cares for you. And then I quoted the wee part about him. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. And secondly, he says, seek God's kingdom and righteousness. But seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, all these daily things of life will be added to you. Matthew 6, 23. And then this is why I want to come down to uh, uh, Maureen's wee poem. Maureen, love this wee robin. She writes different poems. And I give it a few seeds there on Thursday. She loves them, loves the birds. She says a pheasant comes down, a lovely big cock pheasant comes down, and it's fed too. But this is just said, and I said, uh, you know, uh, the following is a poem which illustrates God's love and care as seen through a little robin, written by a lovely Christian lady who has lived on a small agriculture hold holding for over 80 years. She's batting too actually. For those who know her, she is an example of one who lives in total contentment and trust in Jesus. And that's true. But this is her wee poem. Little Robin Redbreast, sitting on a tree. I wonder what you're thinking while you whistle merrily. As you sing a chorus of notes so clear and high, looking down upon us as we hurry by. Do you want to cheer us? Try to slow our pace? Teach us to thank God for blessings in this earthly race. For ears to hear and eyes to see and voice with which to sing. Praise to our Creator, our Saviour and King. Little Robin Redbreast, sing your cheerful song. It will brighten dreary days when the hours are long. It will often remind us how God cares for you. We need never worry if we trust Him too. That's a wee lady. 82 years, lives a simple life, but never seen as a contented woman. And she looks out at the wee robin and sees how God cares for it. She just knows God thinks a lot more of her and the robin. And brothers and sisters in Christ tonight, he loves you. We're going through a difficult time, but I believe that the word that the Lord would have you tonight is, fear not, be not afraid. God bless you, and of one to half seven. Back to you, John. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, really challenging to think on these things. Uh, so many, of course, uh, here, you know, are, uh, so many listening is, uh, you know, the fears and the pressures of, uh, of the COVID. Uh, it's, it's quite serious, uh, you know, um, when you're mixing with the public and have to go to work, that sort of thing, or dealing with children, or whatever it might be, the case might be, is quite uh, challenging. So let's uh, pray then. 
uh, before we close and we can have a, a further chat. <clears throat> Our gracious and almighty God, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the blessings we received even when we were waking up on our beds this morning uh, to hear that great testimony. And we pray, Lord, you lead and guide by your Holy Spirit. We pray, O oh Lord, your blessing. We ask, O oh Lord, that you will guide each one. And we are reminded of this great thought of fear not. And, O oh Lord, we do pray for those, uh, you know, who have to go out to work, who are still the way is opened up for them to work. And we pray, Lord, you will guide and help them uh, through all that, Lord, and through the pressures and the challenges and, uh, of uh, daily life. And uh, we pray, Lord, your blessing. We pray for your protection and your help upon each one. We ask now that you will guide. We pray, Lord, you will direct and uphold each one. We ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen. 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 Right. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, maybe Donald will tell us about his book and what will uh, what'll happen, uh, what we can do. If we get... Uh, uh, well, uh, I was thinking, I put it there. But, uh, I've written this wee book called Still Walking. It's uh, a, a daily reading for every day, just on one side of a uh, it's wee thoughts over 42 years of different people have heard and different wee things that goes poems and, and, and thoughts just to encourage on a daily basis. Uh, in lockdown, as you know, we're doing outreach and that over the summer, all that was cancelled, a lot of meetings cancelled. So the Lord gave me a bit of time. It always my heart to write something.